can Good evening, first. and thank you all for coming. I'm Catherine Walkoff, Assistant Professor of Photography in the School of Art, Media, and Technology here at Parsons School of Design. On behalf of Parsons, the Vera Liss Center for Art and Politics and the New School, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's panel discussion. Our BFA and MFA photography programs are committed to rethinking and redefining a broad range of topic practices in the 21st century. Tonight's topic, Identity, Style, and Dress, the Codes and Politics of Self-Presentation, is one that deserves more focused attention, and therefore I'm grateful to have our distinguished guest speakers here tonight to share their insightful, to, sorry, to share their insights on this prescient subject. I'd like, to take a thank, I'd like to take a moment to thank our collaborators for this evening's program. I'd like to thank Karen Quoney and Emily Donnelly from the Verilis Center for Art and Politics, Pamela Tills from the New School, and Emily Stewart, Michael Famagetti, and Brendan Wattenberg from the Aperture Foundation for making tonight's event possible. I would now like to welcome the editor of Aperture Magazine, Michael Famagetti, who will be the moderator for tonight's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, can we turn down the lights, maybe? Because I'm going to show some slides. Um, but uh, like Catherine said, I'm the editor of Aperture Magazine. And tonight's panel is connected to our current issue of the magazine titled Elements of Style, uh, which looks at the role of style, dress, and beauty in the formation of individual identity. Uh, this issue follows in a series of thematic issues that have delved into looking at the relationships between photography, culture, and society. Um, this includes vision and justice, which we worked on with the art historian Sarah Lewis, an issue focused on representation of African American life, an issue called On Feminism that looked at intergenerational dialogues and um, histories of feminism in relationship to photography, American Destiny, which looked at photography, labor, and economy in the United States on the eve of the last election. The features and elements of style extend from 1940s Cairo and Van Leo's often, um, often gender-bending self-portraiture to a look at the Swiss photographer Walter Pfeiffer's practice which writer, writer Alistair O'Neill observes in the pages anticipated nearly all of the contemporary strategies for queer representation by more than two decades. We also looked at photography in print, and here is a consideration of the commissions for Vogue Ohm International in the late 1990s, where photographers from the worlds of documentary and art created globally engaged fashion stories. And one of the questions animating the elements of style issue is, how does the language of fashion photography inform our sense of self and the way we relate to each other? For the issue, Collier Shore speaks with curator Matthew Higgs for this feature titled Humanity, Visibility, Power. And we borrowed this title from an Instagram post that Collier made in reference to her recent campaign for Saint Laurent. She posted the image that you see here on her Instagram feed and wrote, quote, for anyone who wonders why I wanted to make fashion pictures, now you know. The hashtag with the post read, humanity plus visibility equals power. The images, as Collier says in the interview, were styled and encouraged to perform and play outside what is traditionally seen, heteronormal women. And we had a shift in the lineup tonight, and um, Tanisha Ford, unfortunately, was unable to be here. Um, but she wrote this wonderful profile of um, Kwame Brithwaite for the issue. Brithwaite was a Harlem-based photographer um, who, in the 1960s, used his photography practice to propel the political slogan and idea, Black is Beautiful. Um, but even though Tanisha can't be here to talk about uh, Brithwaite's work, I wanted to use this opportunity to highlight his work as it is an important precedent for thinking about the politics and social role of style and dress. Brithwaite founded the African Jazz Art Society and Studios and also founded a modeling agency for African American women called Grandassa Models. These are the Grandassa Models. 
Um, so he recruited young women in Harlem to model in community-based fashion shows. As Ford writes in the Aperture issue, quote, the Grandassa models were not simply countering images of pale and frail British models such as Twiggy and Jean Shrimpton who appeared in mainstream US publications. They were also challenging the ubiquitous presence of lighter complexioned, straight haired black models and in black owned publications like Ebony. Brithwhite and the Grandassa models turned getting dressed and the circulation of self-generated images of style into a, pictor into a political strategy of visibility. And so these are some more of Kwame's pictures. And we'll actually be honoring Kwame um, Brithwhite at our annual gala on Monday night, which we're very excited to be doing. And at Aperture, uh, we're currently working with Tanisha Ford, um, the historian, on the first major book of Brithwhite's photography from the 1960s. So you can look out for that in early 20, or late 2019. No, rather late 2018. If we can, <laughs> we're in the middle of research, so we'll see. <laughs> Uh, so 50 years after the Black is Beautiful movement, these ideas about inclusivity and in the fashion image remain urgent. Tonight, we are privileged, privileged to expand this conversation with an incredible group of panelists, writer and critic Antoine Sargent, photographer Ethan James Green, show studio editor-at-large Lou Stoppard, who just arrived from London and Thanks. we're very grateful to have here, <laughs> and photographer Nadine Ijuera who are likewise thinking through the meanings and codes of fashion-related imagery, reflecting on the role of fashion in relation to identity, and often questioning restrictive ideas of beauty and gender. Each in their own way acknowledge that clothing and style are powerful forms of expression, shaping who we are and who we might become. So for the format for tonight, each panelist will speak individually for around 10 minutes, um, and I'll, I'll introduce each panelist in greater detail as they have um, incredible biographies as we move into the program. Um, but first, just a bit of housekeeping. I would like to extend our thanks to the generous supporters of tonight's event, including a lead contribution from the Anne Levy Fund, and additional funding from the Grace Jones Richardson Trust, William Talbot Hillman Foundation, and the Board of Trustees and members of Aperture Foundation. Additional funds are from the National Endowment for the Arts, New York State Council on the Arts, with support from Governor Andrew M. Cuomo, and the New York City, New York State Legislator, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. So New York supports us. <laughs> um, so to get this moving along, we'll first hear from Antoine. Sargent, who contributed a piece to our issue on the photographer duo Jalan and Jabril, Jabril Duramel. Um, a little background on Antoine. Um, he recently wrote We Are More Than This, an essay for Tate Modern on the occasion of the museum's exhibition Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power, and is in conversation with filmmaker and artist Arthur Jaffa in the Dallas Museum of Art's Truth 24 frames, frames per second exhibition catalog. His writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Nation, Vogue, W, Interview, and Vice. <laughs> and Aperture. <laughs> and Aperture, yes. So I'll turn this over to you. Um, wait, how do you work? Uh, just the green, okay. yeah. So um, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Um, so, for the, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, very thank last you. minute, but I'm here. <laughs> um, for the kind of, the Duramel um, introduction I wrote to their portfolio, um, when I was asked to do it, two, kind of two images um, appeared in my mind. One was kind of this photograph um, in, my, in a um, black photo album that my mother had of her kind of sitting in this wicker chair um, in her early 20s, and then almost um, in rapid succession, kind of every other image um, that I've seen of, of beauty kind of uh, personified that way, um, which is generally in fashion, 
advertisements. And um, I couldn't really find myself in those, um, or my mother, or women that look like her, um, in those images, because those images are largely um, of white um, figures or white models. Um, and so when, you know, kind of fast forwarding uh, to when I first came upon Dormel's images um, on their Tumblr, I was like, wow, these images look like images that are familiar, which mean the images um, that um, I saw growing up in kind of um, these photo albums. And so um, using that kind of as a point of departure, um, I kind of go into um, kind of what their images mean. Um, and the one here, Daughters, um, Duramel kind of tells a story of um, scouting. So they go around just through the uh, streets of, in this uh, instance, LA, um, looking for models, right? Um, that is kind of a more common practice now, but when they were kind of first starting shooting, that was not a common practice. Um, and they found this group um, of like men and women um, and girls and just hung out with them, talked to them about their lives and talked to them about kind of um, growing up in Watts and growing up, growing up in the Watts projects and, um, and how, and for them it was really important for them to kind of relate to um, the experiences of their sitters, right? Which is um, unique um, when, we're, when we're thinking about, you know, the history of fashion photography and the history of really photography um, which is complicated by, um, it becomes more complex when you're talking about the um, history of picturing black bodies. And so I was kind of always you know, like really struck by um, their kind of commitment to um, their subjects, with they, which they um, called characters, in ways that seem to defy just um, the normal or traditional um, sitter to photographer relationship. And so, um, they made two images. They made daughters, which is uh, for them kind of um, this fas fashion image that kind of defies um, kind of normal conventions of a fashion picture. Um, one because they're all all the kind of figures in this photograph um, are black, um, and two um, because of what kind of the unity of their of the suits and dresses. Um, that are being worn says about the people in those images, right? These are um, in real life um, uh, women and uh, children who live in kind of really difficult circumstances. Um, but for that moment, you know, this image, um, they're able to kind of be beyond that or see themselves how the, how to see themselves in the world how they see themselves in private. And I think um, that was kind of one of the things that really attracted um, Duramel to these image, uh, to, um, to photographing this, uh, these particular um, women and children. Um, and you see it throughout their work. You see kind of this consideration of the black body um, and this in ways in which we don't often get to see in kind of mainstream um, representation, which um, shows that there's a responsibility um, that they have to their images, but also to their subjects. Um, this image, um, I'm forgetting the year that this image was taken, um, but this is obviously the model, um, Alton uh, Mason, I think his last name is. Um, and he's kind of gone on to be kind of to be kind of a bit of a kind of it model at this in this very moment. Um, and in this particular image, um, he's kind of playing three characters for uh, Duramel um, and each kind of signifying kind of a different journey um, for a black young man, um, in this case in America, um, and what that much mean, and what that might mean, right? Um, kind of in the foreground, you have him kind of in kind of repose and reflection. Um, in the background, he's walking away, um, and there, kind of in the middle ground, he's covering his face. And so each of those kind of gestures um, signifies um, something uh, like unique to the black experience, and they were that they were trying to communicate. Um, and how am I on time? Okay. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
And it's also kind of going back, looping back to um, Watts, right? And so these images here are also image, uh, this image here is also an image that was taken um, in Watts in, L in LA um, among the same group of um, women um, that were photographs in the first image and daughters. Um, and you see the difference, right? You see the difference in um, the ways the first they are shot, but also in the ways in which they're expressing themselves. Um, and so, and I asked him kind of why um, the kind of gulf kind of exists between those two uh, images um, of essentially the same people. Um, and, they, and they talked to me a lot about um, wanting to make sure that they were making images that um, were universal, that, um, that not only spoke to them as photographers and the sitters, but also spoke to that you can imagine yourselves um, that everyone, white, black, um, whatever, could imagine themselves um, in these images. Um, and so it, it was, and that's always, and that was for me, in my mind, kind of a radical um, idea around blackness. You know, kind of, we always think about blackness um, signifying very limited experiences um, and definitely not um, able to signify whiteness, right? Or be as universal as whiteness. And, um, and in shooting kind of these two images, they were trying to say that there are um, not only like multiple experiences in blackness, but blackness can be in stand-in um, for you know any number of things that we use whiteness for. Um, and I'm gonna kind of talk through one more image and then um, close with by reading something. Um, this image here um, is kind of interesting because it, it's at least interesting to me um, because you can't really kind of locate the, um, you can't really kind of locate what exactly um, they're like, you can't really locate what this image is trying to do. Like, is it a fashion image? Is it, you know, kind of a, a portrait image? Um, is it, you know, about um, the landscape? You know, is it um, an image that, um, um, is it an image that um, that they, is it like kind of an outtake or is it, you know, and I was kind of really um, like interested in this image because it seems almost like unfinished or in motion, um, which really kind of speaks to um, the ways in which like Duramel is always kind of pulling from different um, kind of parts of photography, the history of photography, um, to kind of create one image. And so you have aspects, as I said, of landscape photography, you have aspects of you know, portraiture, you have aspects of fashion photography, you kind of all in one image. Um, and so to close, um, <clears throat> me and kind of, as Michael kind of said, that um, Arthur Jaffa had a conversation um, in, uh, in the Truth 24 frames um, per second catalog um, at the Dallas Museum of Art, and um, in 1990, and if you're familiar with Arthur's work, um, he's a cinematographer. Uh, most recently, he did uh, Jay Z the cinematography for one of Jay Z's videos. Um, he sh was a cinematographer on both of um, Solange's videos, The Cranes in the Sky, um, and then also he worked on uh, Formation. Before all of that, um, he <laughs> shot this film called um, Daughters of the Dust. Um, and most of you probably know in 1991, but he was sitting in the new school and he was, um, he was having a conversation, he was sitting in the new school to have a conversation. He screened the film and then he was gonna have a conversation about it. And he shared with me in our conversation um, something that I think really speaks to the heart of what Duramel images are trying to do. And so I'm just gonna close by reading um, a part of that. Uh, this is Arthur. Um, when Daughters was originally in the theaters, I gave a talk at the new school. And this older white woman stood up and said, when I see Daughters and I see the grandmother, I don't see race. I don't see color. I see my own grandmother. She was actually trying to be progressive. But I immediately had said, yeah, that's all cool and well. 
but how come you can't see color and see your grandmother? How come those two things are mutually exclusive? How come you have to erase something we cannot, um, how come you have to erase something we, can't, we cannot erase our color? How come you have to suspend that for you to be able to have a point of identification? The question is how come we can't be as black as we are and still be universal? How come we have to refuse who we are in order for, uh, for someone else to be able to identify with us? How come the audience can't see themselves in a thing whether it looks like them or not? It's what black people do because most of what we see when we watch movies are white people. It's what women do have to develop the ability to do because most of what they see are men. It's what gay people are able to do because mostly what they see is heteronormative stuff. It's a muscle that everyone needs to develop, the ability to see oneself in someone else's circumstances without having to paint that person white, make that person straight, or a man. How can you see yourself in the other? That's what it really comes down to, empathy. And I think that um, Duramel photos you know, tend to agree, and that's what they're trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> No, that was. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Antoine. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you, Antoine. Um, now we'll hear from Ethan James Green. Um, so, Ethan James Green's acutely personal portraits are the beautiful signs of a talented new photographic voice. Green injects his originality, distinct personality, and rich experiences of life into a lexicon of editorial photography bringing an unsurpassable degree of intimacy and honesty into fashion and style media. His work has appeared in magazines such as Dazed and Confused, Another Man, Vogue Italia, V-Man, and ID. And I'm excited to announce that Ethan has a portfolio in the next issue of Aperture Magazine, which is titled Future Gender, and looks at uh, representation of transgender lives, communities, and histories in photography. And this next issue of Aperture is guest edited by the wonderful Zachary Drucker. So Ethan, can you take us through some of your work? Yeah, um, just a little warning, this is my first time. A little nervous, <laughs> but bear with me. Um, um, <clears throat> so I guess what I'm just gonna kind of like briefly talk about the process with each of these shoots. Um, this was for W Magazine. Um, and it started out with a conversation with Edward Enenfall, um before he left for British Vogue. And it was really exciting to come to the table and be told to pick out a large cast of models and to right away say that diversity was very important and for Edward, of course, to be 100% on board. Um, and so it was exciting just to go back and forth with him and cast and just present someone to him and him be like, yes, and then for him to bring someone to me and me be yes. And usually there's a lot more struggle. Um, so it was very refreshing to work with him and just, yeah, not have to worry about a pushback. This was for Arena Ohm. Um, it took place last summer. And we had about, we had two and a half days to shoot, which isn't very normal for a shoot nowadays, especially if you're a young photographer. So we were very lucky, and it was great to kind of just get to know everyone, and behind the scenes, the models, and just allowed for the pictures to be really genuine, and um, just to kind of have something a bit more raw, and to be able to go with the flow during the day and not have to worry about this back-to-back -back look that you have to do after look. And we ended the day, there was, we're shooting on a day camp for horseback riding, and there was a um, arena, so when the kids who were at the day camp left, we got to go in the arena with the flash. We had, um, clown backdrops and costumes and very fun to be able to just shoot late into the night and not have to worry about the day ending. This was for another magazine. Um, this was 
during Paris Couture. So we got to go to Paris. And the base inspiration originally was Paris is burning. And so for casting, it was very important that we had a diverse cast. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't even do close to justice to the group of people that Paris is Burning is about. Um, it was great because we were shooting the pictures and it was a mix of models with street cast. And the street cast people that we pulled in really were excited about the fashion and to be able to put on like a, a couture gown. And so we would do hair and makeup and the Paris is Burning moment kind of happened in the studio where we're based and everyone was putting on the clothes, doing runway walk, and the pictures ended up being a bit more still, but it was exciting to work with some friends. My friend Matthew's on the right. Um, and just to like have these kids who love fashion and Alistair Mackey styled, and they were able to talk with him about the clothes and everyone was laughing, and just a bunch of people who really love fashion. Um, yeah. And then this story came out recently. This was for Vogue Um The stylist who did the story originally came to me with the idea of doing a clown. And then it kind of turned into a bit of a self-portrait, I guess. Um, and it was fun because with this male model, I was able to kind of photograph him in a way. Um, I used to model, so when I was modeling, I never really felt like I got photographed in a way by most people that I wanted to be shot. So it was really great to just work with him and just take these pictures that I wish that would have been taken of me. And then this is uh, for Dior magazine. It was a Dior home story. And we wanted to shoot someplace that was kind of chaotic on the street, but at the same time, classic New York in a way, and Midtown's kind of perfect for that. Kind of feels a little bit preserved in a way. Um, and it was also a great way just to kind of show how a diverse cast makes sense. Um, because when you walk on the streets of New York, you have so many different types of people walking past you, and if you go, walk on set to a shoot and your cast doesn't really match that. Or if it's like an all white cast, it's just kind of ridiculous. Um, and I think it was a, just like a good example for a brand like that just to show how it makes sense. Like this is what we should be doing. And then this was for Man About Town um, they asked me to do a personal documentary series. And when I was younger, I went to visit my great grandma in Michigan at the nursing home. And there was a dance that they were preparing and everyone was so excited about it. And um, so I've always kind of like held on to that memory. And so I asked if we could do um, LGBTQI senior dances. And we did it during October, so it was the Halloween dance. Um, and now it's kind of turned into this ongoing series that I've been working on with some friends. Um, yeah, it's very fun. And everyone just gets so excited, and it turns almost into a fashion shoot more than a fashion shoot, because everyone's just screaming and just everyone's cheering and it's so much fun and everyone has such a great time. This was for uh, Modern Weekly China and it was uh, inspired by a personal series that I'd been doing last year, early spring, and I had been following a group of club kids um, from one of their houses, This 
uh, club kid Nikki Otov was throwing this party at Flash Factory. And everyone would meet Nikki at Nikki's place and then go to the subway and then go to the club. And it was really interesting because, well, it was cool because the group of kids just grew bigger and bigger every single night. And the crowd at the club, though, was this group of like beautiful club kids. And then you had a very like cis heteronormative group that filled the rest of the club. So I kind of pulled in all those kids, and I like to sometimes pull in uh, a lot of the people I shoot for my personal series into the fashion work because everyone loves fashion, so it just makes sense to collaborate that way too. Um, so yeah, I just brought in a lot of those kids, and we recreated what was happening. And we didn't have enough extras to fill the back, so the stylist sent her assistant out and bought like some Zara dresses, H&M dresses, shirts, and we were just stopping people on the street and being like, can you please come in? We'll give you like a free dress. We'll... It was very, very in the moment. Um... Um, and then Helmet Lang, this is a very, very fun project and I was able to work with a lot of friends on it. Uh, the casting for this took almost seven months, and we wanted to photograph people who we saw as cult celebrities and who we believed would become future cult celebrities. So it's a mix of downtown kids and then faces that you would recognize. Um, And then this is Yoshi, and then my friend Dara, and they both really love fashion. Um, as you can tell, we all do. Um, but I guess a lot of this campaign too was just kind of bringing groups of people together and just kind of photographing them existing with each other, a mixture that you might not see normally on the street, but something that's really beautiful and that people should see. And then uh, this was for Vogue Italia. Um, it was a little bit of a unique shoot or a first for me, just because when I first was getting into fashion, I was pulling in a lot of friends that I'd worked with in my personal work. And so the magazine really wanted to see me work with an established model. So we paired up with Carly Kloss, and um, they gave us the inspiration of just a model with a nature background. And we were allowed to just kind of run with it. Um, so yeah, we talked about climate change. <laughs> and it, it, it was interesting to work with a model who can be such a chameleon. And uh, it just allows you to focus more on the concept if you really want to. So it was different. And then these images are from my personal series. Um, I've been working on it for about three and a half years. And I worked for David Armstrong before. And I wanted to, well, after getting to know his work, I fell in love with the silver cord. And I wanted to find the equivalent of the people he photographed and of his friends, but find them today, and I am quite a loner, so I guess it was a little bit of a search for friends as well. Um, and it was great because I was able to work with a group of people who really loved fashion, understood fashion, uh, had the hairstyle, had the makeup, and it was kind of revisiting my earliest, earliest work before I got into modeling, before I came to New York, when I would photograph pictures 
of my friends after school or my cousins, and we'd do photo shoots. So it was kind of this full circle moment for me. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. Um, so next we'll hear from Lou Stoppard, who is Show Studio's editor at large and a freelance writer, curator, and broadcaster. She is a contributing editor at GQ and writes regularly for the Financial Times. Her recent exhibitions include Mad About the Boy, an exploration of fashion's obsession with and portrayal of the teenager male um, that was shown at Fashion Space Gallery in London. And her latest exhibition, an exploration of the influence of the north of England on visual culture, co-curated with Adam Murray, opened at Open Eye Gallery in Liverpool in January 2017, and will tour to Somer Somerset House in London in November. Stoppard's debut book, Fashion Together, was published by Rizzoli this month. And Lou is here on book tour. Um, and the book focuses on fashion's most interesting and fruitful creative partnerships. Thank you for that. So as you've already heard, I literally just got off a plane. So if I am completely incoherent, I'm really, really sorry. Um, I also really wish I could drop in like, when I used to model, but I can't do that. So <laughs> forgive me. Um, <laughs> I thought it was really chic. I loved it. Uh, <laughs> So I'm not an image maker, as you probably understood from that introduction. So I look at work by amazing people, such as Ethan and other people, and try and, I guess, get to the bottom of what that work is saying and sort of what it says about broader culture and society. I'm going to talk through some of the projects that you just heard about. We've thrown a lot of words around sort of in, in these um, in these conversations so far, things like identity and diversity, and I guess I hope that every project that I've worked on, whether it's you know an article or an exhibition or sort of an online project, kind of considers where these themes come from. So how identities are formed, particularly through imagery, imagery or through fashion, and how they come to be sort of constructed. And um, I'm going to talk about the North exhibition a bit later, but. I had a really good conversation with the British artist Jeremy Della, who, I don't know if you know his work, but have a look at it if you don't. Um, he's from London, but he has this long interest with the north of England. And he said on the phone, we were just kind of talking about his work, and he said, oh, that sounds like an awful stereotype, and I'm, I'm really scared of putting stereotypes in my, in my work. But then he was like, oh, but Lou, you know, stereotypes can be true, can't they? And that's kind of really stuck with me. I've had that in my head for ages, and I, I think kind of a lot of the work that I do is about trying to understand where stereotypes or motifs or myths come from. I'm going to talk you through different ways of also communicating these ideas because, I mean, I, I sound a bit like one of those people who's like, I'm a model slash blogger slash DJ, you know, people that do lots of different things and everyone thinks they're kind of a dick and they're not good at anything. And that's kind of what my career is like because I kind of curate exhibitions and I do these online projects and then I also write articles. But I think it's interesting to look at the different ways that you can communicate about and around imagery, and there are so many at the moment, and not to sound like a really old person trying to sort of give you advice, but I think it's really exciting that you could you can use you know digital platforms, you can use something like an Instagram account through to a gallery space to talk about imagery today. You have so many opportunities to do that. Anyway, first project. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the show studio projects that I've worked on because, so I worked as editor of show studio for a long time, and now I'm the editor at large there. Um, I don't know why I feel the need to do that when I say my job title, but um, this project is kind of an interesting one. We, so I don't know how much you know about Show Studio. So it's a fashion platform founded by an image maker called Nick Knight, British image maker. And we, the, the site does loads of different things, which is one of the exciting and frustrating things about working there because you're always working on a million different, different things. But we work on a project by project basis. So it's quite different from sort of you know, something like Days or ID's online platform where they'll kind of work by pieces of content, whereas we work by series. And um, so often, this is a good example of that. So this project has like a film and essays and audio within it. Um, a lot of, this was a project that I sort of came up with and it, it was inspired by quite a lot by the link between what was happening in imagery and what was happening on the runways. We've talked a lot about the flat image here, but I think it's interesting to also think about how particularly fashion photography, but kind of all photography comes out of 
other facts, you know, artists that are making work are inspired by the same, if they're from the same generation or the same physical place, they're, they're inspired by the same things as designers who are making work or, or you know, um, musicians who are making work. And I, I always find it so strange how conservative people are where they separate sort of clothing off from photography and all of that. Um, so this project, I mean, you can go and have a look at it online. It's called Girly, and it looked at this kind of obsession that I felt fashion was having with things that were very sweet and very saccharine. And there was a lot of sort of quite interesting talk about whether we were, rec like, this idea of reclaiming elements of sort of girlishness. And and I just, this this project I just found interesting because it goes back to what we were talking about in terms of how these visual codes can mean so many different things to so many different people. And some of the people who were involved in this project were adamant that, you know, someone like Medium Kirchhoff, who's a London-based label, you know, this their clothes to one viewer would look so saccharine and so sweet, and to another viewer they would conjure up images of someone like Courtney Love, and they would see them in a very different, much more rebellious way. So I think, and this project is just a nice way of showing how you can communicate ideas around imagery and using aesthetics to sort of, you know, this project looks at everything from sort of Lolita through to the term basic bitch. So it's kind of an interesting way of sort of presenting a rounded conversation around all the different things that go into a certain style of imagery. Um, the next project is another similar, you can see I like warm word simplistic projects like girly, ugly, <laughs> it's like not very cerebral. Um, so ugly was a similar project which kind of relate, relates to that sort of multifaceted way of sh that show studio works where it's kind of films alongside audio, alongside essays. So this looked at um, kind of deliberate awkwardness and I felt that that's something that's being massively employed in fashion at the moment. It's something that I think Mitya Prada, as that quote at the top, I don't know if you can even read it, she says like, I can't even remember it now, something like ugly feels new because it's like pushes things forward or something. She's much more eloquent than that, but something along those lines. Um, and I, I think what this project tried to sort of consider was why people were relying on these kind of jarring visuals, whether it was in terms of garments or photography to communicate their ideas. Um, the next project is kind of a different example, but I guess it links to the to the book that I've done, which I'm shamelessly plugging. Um, so Unseen McQueen, so Nick Knight, who founded Show Studio, as I said, is quite an interesting photographer because in kind of the 80s, he started filming all of his shoots, which sounds really obvious now because we're all like, you know, used to things like YouTube and what have you, but at the time was quite a sort of, I mean, it wasn't even like an innovative thing to do. It was just kind of like a weird thing to do because he'd just put like a webcam there. Um, but it's meant that he's got these, this amazing footage of all these different shoots. He did it for the first time because he was shooting Naomi Campbell and she was like dancing. I think she was listening to something on her Walkman and dancing around and he was like, this is really weird that only about three people are going to see this. So he started recording his shoots. And this project is a really interesting one because this is kind of what Show Studio does really well, I think, which is look at how images are made and that process in which images are made. And that reveals so much about that final image. Um, and a lot of what you see in fashion or in any magazine or in any book of images is the final image and you don't understand all the sort of haphazard thing. And it's really interesting hearing you talk about your shoots because you understand much more of the sort of context around them. So with this shoot, with this project, we went back and found all of Nick's footage relating to Alexander McQueen because they collaborated together for a long time. And we put up Nick discussing the final image, but also the shoot. And you can just tell so much from about the, the time and the intentions of the people when you see the way that the shoots are put together. And I guess this is a really interesting project in terms of how we read imagery, because McQueen and Nick's images was, they're quite, um, I mean, McQueen, it, it kind of everyone like adores him now because Savage Beauty was like obviously so popular, but he got like really slammed at the time and people thought he was sort of quite misogynistic, particularly with his early collections. And you can, it's very easy to look at the imagery that he made with Nick and take very sort of immediate visual codes from it to do with sort of violence or mental illness and what have you. And when you see how the shoots are put together, you, you pick up on these other sort of references or moments or even like elements of sort of tenderness between how he's putting an image together, which I think is really interesting. It kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the start, about this idea of how images are made and why they're made. Um, moving out of the digital space into the physical space. So this is an exhibition that I did, um, which I have that thing with now. You know when you read something that you wrote like a couple of years ago and you're like, oh God, like that's kind of slightly what I'm like with this exhibition because there's so much that I wish I could have put in it that there wasn't room for. But this exhibition was called Mad About the Boy, and it looked at fashion's 
obsession with the teenage male and the way that it kind of portrays and constructs images of said boy um, owes a heavy debt to Germaine Greer as the boy, obviously. Um, and it also was kind of provoked by that girly project that I did um, on Chase Studio, which shows how, you know, just going back to sort of, if you're interested in how images are constructed, you, like, you, it kind of leads you on this spider web of different, um, different themes and motifs. And this, um, in this picture in particular, so it's two shots from Nick Knight's Skinhead Skit series, and then it's a clip from Larry Clark's Kids, so kind of obvious things that you would look at if you were looking at portrayals of the teenage male. But I guess what I'm, what this, this exhibition included clothing and photography and it had even fine artwork because it had Mark Leckie's Fiorucci Made Me Hardcore, which is a film, but obviously Mark's an artist within it. Um, and I, I think what I was interested in this is how you get common motifs or themes that emerge again and again and again in a portrayal of a particular thing, which is exactly what the North Show is about, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. And within this show, I kind of identified like, I can't remember if it was seven or eight, it was like a, a few, less than 10, um, sort of themes of the boy that would come up again and again and again in fashion images and fashion collections. So it was like the boy as outsider or the boy in the club or the boy in uniform or the boy as this kind of fluid, um, free being that could move between different sexualities and different... Um, almost like defy gender in a way and how that was really fetishized around the boy, like this idea of youth being connected to these limitless freedoms and these limitless opportunities. Um, and there's this real sort of duality about how everyone treats youth where, you know, people presume you're so smart and you know everything, but they also sort of admire you for that amazing na naivety of youth. So that's kind of what this show was about. But it is amazing how from generation to generation you see the same themes just being rehashed like season upon season. And that's exactly what this show was about. And just sort of speaking more broadly in terms of like working as a curator, like I've never really had any interest in doing a show that is like, I mean, I shouldn't say this because I probably like cut myself out of a job or something but like I don't have that much interest in doing like single like I wouldn't want to do like a retrospective of a designer's career necessarily unless it was like a super super interesting one or presented in a new way and I don't know if I'd ever be that enthused about doing a single photographer show like I'm much more interested in bringing together different people's work because I think you understand so much more about different moments and different you understand more about identity if you look at how how identities are formed by groups, they're formed by societies and different people presuming different things and communicating those things to others, whether it's through you know, word of mouth or, or media, and they get built up and built up and built up, and those are the kind of shows I like doing. And I really like doing shows that, that sort of defy expectations of what a photography show looks like. So my, sh I mean, you can kind of see it from the next, my shows look like they look completely bonkers. Um, and like grossly unprofessional. Like this show had like, there were like lights and there were music. It was just like mad. Like I worked with a set designer called Tony Hornaker who used to do all the sets for Medium Kirchhoff. And he, he like wanted to make a corner of the exhibition look like a bathroom. I didn't actually include a photo of it, but you can see pictures online. So there was like these beautiful J.W. Anderson garments like hanging next to this like toilet, which he'd installed in the middle of the gallery. And I mean, you can kind of see Nick Knight's images they're actually hang, hung on the side of a toilet cubicle, which was fun. And in this gallery space, fashion space gallery, it's in University of the Arts. So I loved that young people found it really exciting. And there was a mirror, obviously, because it was meant to feel like a bathroom. And it was actually kind of depressing because there was a hashtag for the exhibition. And I kept getting like notifications that people were using the hashtag. And I went on it and it was like, none of it was people taking pictures of the work. It was just people taking selfies in the mirror, like again and again and again. But you know, gallery engagement, so that was great. Um, these are some pictures by, which were also in Mad About the Boy and the same photographer features in North. And um, I often like include, when I get really obsessed with the same people and they go in every show. So Jason Evans and Mark Leckie are like, I feel like I could never do a show without Jason Evans and Mark Leckie, which they're probably both like, Lou, just leave me alone, but shan't. Um, Jason is an amazing photographer and these, I love these pictures because they just, I'm, well, I'm really obsessed with, it, with photography when it sort of preempts stuff. So when you see an image, there's a photographer called Shirley Baker who I'm obsessed with who takes pictures. Um, she took sort of street pictures from the 60s onwards and if you put her pictures now in Mad About, in, um, what's, God, what was it, Mad About Town, 
or ID, you know, they look like a Jamie Hawksworth or like a Harley Weir or something like that. Like, and Jason's work is exactly the same. It preempts so much, you know, the mood of fashion. And I find that really fascinating. And I love, I love his commitment to, to genuinely documenting diversity. So he, here, he just went out onto, street, onto the streets of different northern cities, and some of these are in, in London, and he just took pictures of what people were wearing. It's like straight up photography. Um, in all these different cities, and they, they just look amazing. And it, again, it goes back to what I was talking about at the start, about not being able to separate different genres. It's like you can't, like this is a photography project, but it's about clothing, and those two things cannot be separated from each other. Um, this is just another shot of that exhibition. You can see it was very professionally done. So this was a recurate, this was a restaging of a Medium Kirchhoff presentation, which was one of the best presentations. It's Spring Summer 13, their menswear show. Um, and we just remade it, because also fashion shows, are re they're really hard. I mean, I don't know how many, how many of you like, enjoy going to exhibitions of like fashion dress, but you, I always feel like the runway show has never quite like, managed to make it into an exhibition. You always get like, these very static garments, and, you, and if runway shows are displayed, they're displayed as like a video. And what I was quite interested in here was this idea of, I thought the, sh the fashion show was great, and I wanted to make it so people who came to the exhibition could experience what it was like to be at that fashion show and the glut of imagery and trends that had been sparked by that show because I mean basically everything that's on show at London Fashion Week at the moment like owes a great debt to what Medium Kirchhoff were doing. Um, now I'm going to do a shameless plug for my book um, but the book does relate to what I was talking about because thinking about how people make work and why they make the work that they do Basically, the book that I've done is about collaboration. So it's like conversations with different duos in fashion, um, two of which are photography duos. No, there are four different photographers in there, but two of photography duos, so Met and Marcus and Innes and Venud, who I know you guys have a very good relationship with. Um, and then Nick Knight's in there with Daphne Guinness and uh, Ruth Ogburn, the filmmaker's in there with Gareth Pugh. So basically, what this book, that's the cover, what this book tries to document is um, how people's sort of visual identities or how their priorities or senses of self are made. And, and the reason I find collaboration so fascinating is because for fashion is like really, and probably in photography definitely as well, or like fetishizes these industries of like greats, like, you know, single genius mavericks, which is just completely untrue. Like but all of these industries completely rely on collaboration. So people working very closely together, you know, whether it's any great picture, particularly fashion imagery, relies on, you know, the stylist, the hair person, the model, all of them as, as kind of you were implying through your conversation. And that's kind of what this book is about and these formative um, influences that different people have on each other. Um, and they really, really, really can shape each other. So, I mean, there's, this is Rick Owens and Michelle Lamy, um, and they talk about being sort of aesthetically destined, which I thought was a really nice way of putting it. And th it was really inspiring doing this book because I went and interviewed I think it was 18 different pairs. And I mean, there's a bunch of people in the books like Victor and Rolf, um, Vivian Westwood with Andreas, Mark Jacobs and Katie Grand. And you kind of expect that when they're talking about meeting, it's going to be this like, you know, like fireworks, huge moment because these some of these partnerships are like so pivotal and shape how we understand fashion today. But all of them met in ways that you've all probably met people and I've met people in these super haphazard, often like quite embarrassing circumstances. And then they've given birth to these like amazing creative relationships. So like Katie and Mark met because they like Katie like crashed a, a party and um, he happened to be there. Um, the boys that do Prenza Shula met like smoking pot outside a club and then they like bumped into each other again at Parsons and were like, oh, hey. Um, Innes and Venud met because Venud saw Innes through like a classroom door and he just thought she was like really hot and then they kind of started working together. So it's kind of nice because it kind of reminded me of like how important, I mean, collaboration is so important and, and you, it, you realize that it kind of can't be fake. Like some of these people who you meet, you know, in, in your day-to-day -day life as a creative person, and um, thanks, as a creative person, like, will really sort of shape, yeah, like, who you are and how you work. This is just more shots from the book. Some um, Victor and Rolf, this thing is the nude. They very kindly let me shoot all their sketchbooks, which they keep all their Polaroids in. Um, Philip Tracy and Isabella Blow, Tom Brown, Stephen Jones. And I did a little exhibition to go with it, because, as I said, I really like moving between things being, like, in print and online and in physical space. This is a show that I'm working on at the moment, 
So we staged it up in Liverpool and it's um, touring down to Somerset House. So this show looks at the influence of the north of England on visual culture. I mean, I don't know how many of you are like, familiar with the makeup of England, but we have this very strange divide between north and south, which is not just in terms of identity, but actually very sort of practical things um, in terms of, you know, the north has suffered m far greater hardships in terms of um, breakdown of industry than the South has, and there's a massive, massive split. You know, it's, it's really common that you would say, oh, no, I'm, I'm northern or southern. It's, it really defines sort of who you are. And I kind of sit between them because I was born in the South, but my parents are northern. Um, this is a group show. There's about 50 different artists in it. And I guess what's really interesting about this show is we try to draw parallels between documentary imagery right through to fashion imagery through to sort of fashion collections. So in the hang that you can see there, You've got like a big Jamie Hawksworth, a girl in the blue suit, sat next to a Peter Mitchell photograph. Underneath it, you've got a Jordan Bulmer photograph from the 1960s, which is two girls with their hair in rollers, which looks almost identical to an Alice Hawkins shoot from 2013 that went into Love magazine, um, which in its aesthetic is very, very similar to the photograph next to it, which is a project by a documentary photographer called Michelle Sank, who shot women on Liverpool's waterfront. And what this show is about is exactly what I was talking about before, which is how myths and motifs are created. So it's not really a show about photography, and it's definitely not a show about northern style. It's about how these, it's about how identity is shaped and how these motifs appear again and again and again. So you know, girls with their hair in rollers, like these big industrial like quite grim landscapes that are you know, used as a stage for this sort of romance to be played out, terraced houses, domestic spaces, and you see them sort of, it's how things that have some base in truth become props or sets that people employ, and how we, you know, a reader or an audience, um, rely on those things to presume or understand certain things about, about an image or about what it's trying to communicate. And I guess what we're trying to do with the show is show how these things have sort of, they've created our understandings of things and how they're so readable to people. Um, so yeah, this, this is the show obviously installed at Open Eye. So there again, you've got like Dave Sims images next to, um, I mean, next to Glenn Lutchford, next to more John Bulmers, um, Dave Ellison, those clothing in that exhibition. So yeah, this is traveling. If you do find yourself in London, it's traveling to Somerset House. It's opening in a couple of weeks. But again, we mix like clothing and there were lots of magazines shown in the show. That's me. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Liz. Okay, now we'll hear from Nadine Ijewera. Nadine is a fashion, a fashion and portrait photographer from London. Her work frequently touches on the subject of identity and diversity through location and through many of her subjects. Of her work, she says it aims to go against the standard beauty ideals and showcase beauty through culture and different ethnic backgrounds. My work is a celebration of these differences in culture. I am drawn to the uniqueness of this. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The British Journal of Photography, Dazed, Vogue Italia, and Office Magazine. Uh, a portfolio from Nadine's fashion shoot in Lagos, Nigeria, um, which was or originally presented at Red Hook Labs last spring, is featured in the current issue of Aperture. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk through um, a couple of projects and, yeah, just the meaning um, behind kind of my work. Um, so um, as mentioned, um, this uh, is an image from a project that I worked on back in uh, April in my, well, part of my heritage, my dad's Nigerian. So I shot this in Nigeria. And it was um, kind of looking at... Uh, Nigeria is kind of known to be qu quite a conservative country in terms of the roles of uh, men and women and the way in which they kind of dress and present themselves. And, you know, whilst I was out there, I, um, you know, I hung out with a lot of, you know, um, the youth and the younger generation, and they're not necessarily like that. They're very much about expressing themselves and their identities and kind of blurring the line between masculine and feminine. And I, I wanted to capture that within um, the series. Um, and so um, everyone here was kind of street casted and it was kind of looking at, if you like, um, 
you know, elements of both. So, for instance, in this shot, um, the way he's tipping his hat is a very masculine thing to do, but the way in which he's dressed is very feminine. So it's, again, playing with those ideas and kind of, you know, um, you know, it's a new way of seeing the younger generation. So, uh, yeah, this was... Oh, go back one. <laughs> this was... Um, yeah, this was what I, sh I showed at Red Hook Labs first of all and took it to kind of Unseen and um, published with Aperture. Um, so this is an image from kind of my personal work and a lot of the people that I shoot are not from modeling agencies. They're, I'm very much into kind of street casting, you know, going out, you know, um, looking for people that are kind of different because um, I'm all about kind of showing... Um, you know, diversity and also, um, you know, going, like I said, going against kind of beauty ideals within the, the fashion industry. You know, if you look at um, packages from modeling agencies, they all kind of have the same look and it was very repetitive and boring. And especially growing up in London, um, London is a very diverse country um, and, you know, a diverse place. And I don't feel like the fashion industry, even in London, reflects that. And I think it's, you know, something that, you know, it's very important, I think, and it's something that should be shown. Um, so, you know, um, this was just actually, you know, with a girl um, who'd come from, I think, Australia. She's Sudanese, and, you know, we just kind of booked a studio, and, well, I worked with a stylist, and we kind of just, you know, ran with it, if you like, and produced some really nice images. And especially this next image, I wanted to kind of look at, when we think of, say... There's certain things when we think of them, we have this idea in our head. So, for instance, when we think of angels, if you like, we have this image in our head, you know, Renaissance type, curly, blonde hair, white kind of cherub, if you like. And I wanted to give a new perspective on that um, and show, you know, something as beautiful as an angel can be reflected in a number of kind of different cultures and can be identified in a different way. Um, so with this project, I actually started last year and I showed this at Tate Britain and it was, um, it was looking at siblings and the similarities and differences between them. Um, and I wanted to kind of, in particular, I looked at um, sisters. Um, I just think as a female, I relate to you know, women more and I'm interested in exploring um, that gender a lot more. And... Um, so in each of in, in the series, um, none of them are actually twins. They're all there's always one that's you know a couple of years older than the other. But I wanted the focus to be mainly you know their face. So you could look at the features, look at what was the same, and look at what was different. And so I chose to have the same sort of setup, um, the same style of dressing, the same colours. So you could really focus in on that person and kind of what they were trying to say. And it was really funny because um, a lot of the siblings had never actually been that close um, <laughs> to one another. And it was just interesting seeing this bond kind of, you know, form. And I wanted, you know, the way that they were posed in position to be very, very simple as well. Um, so, yeah, there's a couple of images from that. Um, so this next uh, editorial was something I've just recently done for Vogue Italia. Um, this is more of a, like a fashion story, if you like. And again, you know, um, using models of kind of different ethnicities um, and bringing that together and kind of, you know, um, not kind of, I don't know, not, in, not giving a platform, but kind of, you know, um, wanting to have that, you know, cultural diversity within my images again. Um, yeah, so this was kind of, yeah, a fashion story. I worked with a kind of set designer and that sort of thing. And you know, brought it all together as well. I'm very much into, I don't know if you've noticed, I'm very much into faces. So <laughs> a lot of my work is very, very close up and kind of honing in on that detail as well and um, looking at those kind of little imperfections and things. Um, because I think that's what, again, draws me in um, to a person and, want, and is a reason why I want to photograph them. another portrait, another face. Um, so this was another editorial I did for um, Material Magazine. 
again, in terms of casting this girl here, which she was street casted. And I found as well, a lot of, um, a lot of people I've street casted have actually become models now, um, which is interesting and also quite annoying because bookers are, won't then let me book them, but okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I found them, so yeah. <laughs> sort of thing. But um, again, you know, this was a beauty story actually. Um, and again, I wanted to show, you know, um, you know, being of um, an African descent, you know, there's different shades, you know, it's not just kind of one color. There's not just, you know, not everyone's kind of dark and not everyone's kind of light, there's in between. And some people have freckles and, you know, that sort of thing. So I really wanted to kind of document and show that. So yeah, this was that kind of series. And again, this is from a, a personal series where I kind of, you know, um, documenting kind of um, different uh, kind of cultures that you won't necessarily see within the industry. Um, but again, focusing on the face, focusing on certain features. And I just think, you know, I just, I just kind of, you know, if I see someone, kind of chase them and say, I'd love to kind of photograph you sort of thing. Um, but yeah, a lot of my work is kind of about that. Um, and then this was um, for uh, Stella McCartney, actually, and it was really great because um, it's, it was kind of a, a, a smaller project, and she she's working, I think, twice a year. This project is called uh, Stella By, and she's working with kind of artists she, uh, she likes and kind of what they're doing, and she gives the kind of budget and... Uh, the latest collection and you can kind of go shoot it and interpret it in the way you want. And I knew that I wanted to again bring um, a project back home uh, to my heritage and show this was also shot in Lagos and I wanted to kind of give a new perspective on Stella McCartney and um, so it was women's wear but I decided to shoot it on men. Um, but also again, everyone here was street casted and it was really nice to bring um, and involve the community and kind of give back to the community as well. So this is another kind of image from that. And I worked with a stylist called kind of um, a stylist called Ib Kamara. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. If you are, then definitely check him out. But it was all about kind of layering as well and working not just with the Stella McCartney brand, but also bringing in elements of kind of Lagos. So, you know, um, using kind of belts that were from the market or using kind of fabrics that were from the market to not just make it an advertorial, if you like. So here's another image from that. And yeah, so it's just kind of mixing up, you know, um, and not wearing the garments the way that they should be worn. So like, for instance, in this shot here, it's a, a women's swimming costume, but we decided to, you know, put it backwards and really play with that um, and play with kind of, play with the conventional ideas of presenting something as well. And all the headdresses and things, you know, that's another element, you know, because in um, Nigeria, uh, the women, you know, they're, when they've got events and weddings and things, they'll have the most elaborate sort of headdresses on that they pin and tuck. And I really wanted to kind of play with that idea and play with that on men as well. Um, and so this editorial was, is in the latest issue of uh, Office magazine. And again, you know, I wanted to, my casting, I wanted to use, you know, um, kind of people that, you know, you wouldn't really, well, you don't see as much of in kind of fashion industry. Um, and this was shot in, uh, it had kind of a few, we had a futuristic kind of vibe for it. And it was shot in this area of Kent called Dungeness, which is very, it, it's on the coast and it's a very, very flat kind of land and that was the, the perspective I wanted to show and this kind of almost, yeah, alien futuristic vibe going on. Um, and I don't know if you've also noticed in my work, I love having doubles, so <laughs> I don't know. I think, it's to relate, I think it relates back to the whole siblings thing. I just love, I love looking at people in sets, if that makes sense, and also, you know, there's always, you know, they always say that you have a, a, a doppelganger somewhere in the world. There's someone, someone that looks like you, but yet you're not related. So again, I think it's that playing with that idea and concept as well. And so this was shot actually in Ghana, 
mm, maybe well, last month, I think, the month before. And um, I was kind of working with them. I don't know if you're familiar with the brand Studio 189. It's run by Rosario Dawson. Um, and I was actually on another assignment for Vogue out there and randomly met Rosario, which was great. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, she, she, she knew about my work and that sort of thing, so we kind of worked on this together, and this was kind of the campaign images for that. But again, you know, you, you, know, you just meet people randomly in you know, Ghana of all places. I never expected that to happen. So, you know, this was the finished result of that. But again, it was kind of, we casted local girls and, um, you know, um, yeah, we didn't use any modeling agencies. You know, we, Rosario styled it herself. So it was a very kind of intimate project. And I prefer ones like that where you haven't got, you know, 101, I don't know, sort of people on set. Um, I prefer to uh, work more so on one-on-one -on -one with people, I think, because you, it brings out more of their, their personality as well. And I'm, I just love the intimacy of those projects. Um, and yeah, that's what you've done. <laughs> Thank you, Nadine. Thank you all for, for those presentations. Um, I just wanted to start with a question for Ethan and Nadine. Um, in, when we did this interview with Collier Shore, one of the things that she said that really struck me was she, she said that I could be scarred by fashion images and that she wanted to replace the pictures that she found alienating with her own pictures. And I'm curious what kind of pictures um, you were looking at as teenagers and what you loved and what you found lacking. But yeah. you and then me and then Ethan. Um, so for me, I think when I was younger, I used to kind of flick through uh, magazines like Vogue and that sort of thing. And I think how I got on into kind of looking at identity and diversity and culture and that sort of thing is because um, a lot of the shoots I found that had people of different ethnicities showed the same sorts of themes and the same sorts of stereotypes, um, kind of regurg regurgitations of tropes. And I wanted to kind of explore that. And, and I thought, you know, why, why is that? And where has that kind of come from? Um, and yeah, why do we associate this type of ethnicity with, you know, this sort of behavior or, you know, whatever. Um, and so um, that's, yeah, that kind of led me to what I do now. And I think that, that that's, if you like the images that kind of scarred me because I wanted to go against it and, because I I felt that you know it wasn't true to you know that being or you know that culture or that country and they were nothing like that so, um, so um, I thought it was important to kind of you know showcase and go against that and you know that's what kind of my work is about now so yeah um, I mean I guess for me, I, the first time I saw fashion images was in a mall in Michigan. And um, at first it was like, you'd see uh, like Banana Republic, Gap, um, Abercrombie and Fitch. And once I like looked into modeling and found images that I saw that I saw someone who was like skinny and that I was like, oh, you know what? I relate to that person. I got really excited. Like I already loved fashion images, but I got even more excited. So I guess for me, remembering that feeling of seeing myself or seeing someone that I was like, oh, I'm kind of like that person. For me now, it's kind of in my work, hoping that I can do that for other people. Mm -hmm. So to give someone else a chance to see themselves. And so, you had a background as a model, and mm -hmm. that was your entree into this world. So how does that, like, how, how has it changed now being on the other side of the lens? I mean, I learned so much because it was like a span of 10 years. Um, and I was able to work with like the very best, the very worst, everyone in between. Um, and you really learn like what works, what doesn't work, what makes someone feel comfortable. Um, and yeah, like with direction and it, it's really helpful to be on the other side and just know what that person might be thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and even now, like if I'm doing a shoot, I get even like involved with the posing myself and it's, there can be moments where it's like, okay, mirror what I'm doing or, um, yeah. <laughs> 
And Nadine, maybe you could talk more about collaboration because that's been a thread here. I mean, even what Ethan's describing now is the kind of collaboration between the photographer and the subject. But you work a lot with Ibrahim Kamara. Yeah. And when you did the workshop, Nadine did this wonderful workshop at Aperture yeah. the other day for young photographers. And you kind of described him as an artist in his own right. And I'm wondering how you, he has such a signature style, like mm -hmm. how you collaborate, how you negotiate that, your different. Um, um, so I think, well, I've known Ib for about 10 years. So, you know, we've got that kind of relationship and friendship there already. But um, I think the thing is that we, we kind of respect each other and we, we respect each other's ideas and kind of suggestions. And I knew that I wanted to, him to work with me on you know my projects in Nigeria because not only see him being from Africa so he he has that kind of aspect to him already but I also wanted him I also with his style of work he's very much about layering and creating there and then and I knew that I wanted to you know there was a layering to my work and I wanted to combine all elements um, so, um, you know, I, I felt he was the, you know, the perfect choice for, you know, working on this project. Um, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lou, as um, working at a site like Show Studio, you have a kind of real 360 degree um, point of view, I feel like, on the industry, because you're working, I just work with photographers, but you're working with designers, stylists, and these questions of inclusivity and um, representation in that sphere that have come up. I'm wondering just if you have general observations about how the industry is addressing that. Um, I think it's definitely a time of, it's a huge question, So, but I think it's definitely like a time of change in the industry and like, I feel like one of the biggest things that, that has been really important is um, it sounds like such a cliche to talk about like how social media has enabled people to like, you know, comment on things, but it's actually really, really valid and really important that that has happened because the generation of photographers that you guys were probably, you know, talking about looking at, they didn't have that feedback on their work. They had like an editor's eye. It's kind of the same with the designers. They had like an editor's eye and it would appear in a magazine and then it kind of went out into the world and actually, you know, you didn't know if people actually liked your work or not. Whereas now, I think what's really interesting is because of these different channels that we have, like, you can take issue with something and your voice is heard and it's really important and that is massively shaping stuff. Like, I mean, we were talking about Terry Richardson like before this panel started, but you know, like how brilliant that someone like super disgusting doesn't get to work anymore, like amazing and how important <laughs> that like, but it is really important that and people get to sort of call things out and say, I don't see myself in that picture or that picture is offensive or that picture is a stereotype that I am uncomfortable with and something has to happen, you know, like, and it's, you see it with like people calling designers out for copying, people calling photographers out for their casting, people trying to go into efforts to make the modeling world, you know, more responsible, which is obviously like, you know, it could be a massive fight. And I think that that's been quite fascinating to watch and mm -hmm. is very exciting to see continue. Do you want to comment on that, Antoine? <laughs> sure. Um, I guess like my, what I'm always thinking about with <clears throat> fashion or with photographers or kind of, um, I like how you say get to the bottom of kind of what is happening with art is particularly in the, <clears throat> the fashion conversation with, with places that you talk about gatekeepers, right? So Vogue and, and you know, um, ID in a way and all of these magazines and editors and, you know, and photographers who really just kind of created these worlds for us, right? Um, and then kind of, as you also talked about with the advent of the internet, um, well, with social media, um, which came later, those worlds start to fall apart. Right, they did not. They were no longer viable. Right, it was no longer viable to put all white models, you know, um, in a story about Western civilization. Right, it was no longer vi viable to sell luxury um, with, you know, the same doe-eyed, you know, blonde hair, blue-eyed, whatever, you know, model. And so I, all the questions, I'm, you know, I'm asking, and we're saying that Vogue is getting better, and you know, this is getting better, and that, and Edwards, at you know, etc. But you know. 
I'm like, is it because they're dying they're changing or because they really want to change? And that's always, and so like, I'm always like super kind of skeptical, even when like, you know, photographers I respect or, you know, uh, stylists I respect or um, designers I respect um, talk about, you know, diversity or don't. I'm always kind of I'm like, are you doing that because you're committed to, uh, you know, diversity or inclusion? Or are you doing that because that's the new kind of like, because it's chic now, you know? And I think that those are always the questions I'm having. You know, Vogue is launching, you know, or Condé Nast launching the million, and it's not just a single amount, but, you know, a million and, you know, things around inclusion and all these things. And it goes, you know, for 125 years, Vogue, you ignored that black people existed in this country, you know? Um, you suddenly have a clue or you just figured out how the internet works you know like it really those are really kind of the the questions i'm asking because like what you're at least what i'm seeing is people are really quick to say diversity to say that they want to be inclusive and you know and it, 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 you know, they'll put you in an ad or they'll put you, you know, make you the face of something. And then behind the scenes, as we saw with Harry Weinstein or with, you know, Terry Witcherson or kind of in modeling, there's a whole horror show. And so, I don't know, I'm kind of interested in like, how do we get beyond just like the image to make sure that like we're really reflecting in society the things that we are now saying we do. I hope that made sense. Mm -hmm. No, that's a really great point. <laughs> We're actually running short on time, so maybe that's actually a really good point to open it up no to questions to yeah. from so the audience. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know that there are questions here. There are two mics here in the aisles if people have questions. Yeah, can you come to the mic, please? Hi, my name is Whitney. Um, I reached out to you on Instagram. Oh. <laughs> um, I just want to ask, what has been your greatest challenge just fulfilling your own image? Because with all of this, there comes like bias, like, oh, you can't do this, or your work is extremely different from the norm. Like, what keeps you going um, on with your projects? And just what motivates you against anything that just tries to tell you no? Like, you're too different. Um. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I think um, being an artist, I think the one thing that you need to kind of, you know, learn quite quickly is that there's always going to be sort of some sort of criticism, and you can't let that, you know, you know, get in the way or put you down as an artist. And I think. I think with social media and things like that as well, you know, it's very, it's very kind of, um, if you like, um, very open, and you know, you're seeing things every day. You're 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 constantly kind of questioning yourself. You're saying, oh, if I did that, maybe I would get more recognition, or if I did that, you know, I would be the next successful fashion photographer. But I think it's always a case of kind of staying genuine to who you are, and no matter how, you know, um, people may put you down. Because people have, people have said to me, oh, maybe, you know, they've said, you only photograph kind of black people, or, you know, whatever. And can you even photograph any other, other race, if you like? And I think that was something I found you know, most insulting, because if there was to say a photographer who photographed all white models, no one would say anything. They'd just think they were amazing. And I think, you know, that's something we need to kind of, you know, get past. Um, and, you know, we, in the West, we are very, a very kind of diverse culture. And I think, you know, now is the time to kind of, you know, accept that and it not be, as you were saying earlier, not be a, a trend, if you like, because that's something I'm very, very worried about. Um, just because, you know, I've been, you know, the people I photographed, I've been doing it for a number of years, and then suddenly it's now, you know, Africa is a new call, or, you know, um, loads of publications want you to, you know, be in the magazine, or they want you to work on these projects, and I think you have to have, 
I don't know. I, I always have this kind of mindset, and I'm always kind of wor I'm always kind of thinking about okay, but are they just doing it because it's you know the in thing right now, or is this going to move us us forward as you know as uh, it, within the fashion industry and you know as as a community, if you like. Um, so you know, you know, people may say these things, but you know, I just. I know that my work is genuine at the end of the day, and I think, you know, as I said, that's, that's the most important thing, and you kind of just get on with it, if you like, and it's not about, you know, other ones' opinions, everyone else's opinions, because art is very subjective as well, so there's no right or wrong answer, so, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Thank you, you did. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Anyone else? Can you come to the mic, please? <laughs> Sorry. It's for the archive. Hello, my name is Yuri. Hi. Uh, as a, to photographers, a question. Uh, what equipment do you use, and do you use any assistance? And do you see the picture kind of taken before you took the picture? In other words, do you work on your <clears throat> shots, or do you see what the light would be in the final product? Uh, do you kind of preset it, or do you take a picture just by accident? Um, do you, want to do you choose <laughs> when? When do you choose? When do you choose uh, a color? When do you choose black and white version? Okay. Or? Um, I well, guess just, it, but just ph photography as a skill. In other words, more on equipment maybe uh -huh. touch. But that thing. I mean, I guess it, it totally depends on what you're shooting, and if it's something personal, it can be something really minimal. I mean, yeah. I mean, for me, like usually the best pictures is just my camera. Exactly. Yeah. And then, like maybe end of day light, um, or it's like about an on camera flash. But then, if there's a fashion moment that, or say it's like a commercial moment, then you need more equipment. But then, hopefully, you can hire an assistant that would know what to do in a way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really clueless when it comes to equipment, yeah. but like best with I'm just saying. a camera. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very much, you know, as Ethan said, I'm very much, you know, I, sh I shoot medium, medium format, so I work a lot with film, and I think I prefer it to digital. I just, I just feel like it's something that's a lot more tangible, and I just enjoy the results a lot more, and it's also about the process, I think. Um, I love kind of seeing the end result. I love kind of, you know, going into the dark room, doing my own prints, um, it just makes it that more, much more special and it's um, a lot more intimate, you, if you like, instead of just putting it straight onto the computer and it all becoming kind of electronic and that sort of thing. And it teaches you to be patient as well. You were saying about, you know, having shots and things in your mind, you know, you're limited to say, depending on what format, you're limited to maybe 11 or, or 16 shots on a roll and you really take the time to consider and, you know, if you like perfect your shot, um, and there's a lot more meaning to it, opposed to you know just pressing a button and holding it down and clicking endlessly, and you may you may end up with one kind of great image, but is the meaning kind of still there? Um, so yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. one more question. Hi, uh, my name is Shreya. My question is for Ethan and Nadine as well. I'm wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about how you became confident with your style and when you felt like your work really represented what you wanted to be making. Do you want to join with you? So, I mean, confidence is a funny word because I still don't think I'm 100% confident in my work. I mean, I know what I'm interested in. Um, I know what I want to document, and I want my work to say, but um, I've forgotten the question, I'm sorry, could you repeat that, it's just gone off my head. Yeah, and my style, yeah, and my style. Um, oh, um, so, sorry, can you, can you say one more time? I'm just, I'm really nervous as well, so. I think that's, I think that's, 
I think that's a wonderful thing, though, because at that time you can experiment and truly kind of find what you want to do and the sort of images you want to take. And I feel like, you know, I mean, even now there's maybe kind of, because the funny thing about editorials is that they may not come out for six months, but as an artist, you know, I'm not where I was six months ago. My style has again, you know, developed and I'm, you know, maybe wanting to shoot people in a, in a completely different way or if I was given that topic again, I would have a completely different outlook on it. So I think it's just about, you know, I think it's also about, you know, the teams that you work with as well, because I'm, I'm very much about, you know, a collaboration um, in terms of yeah, fashion work, because I feel like, you know, you may have a concept and idea, but, you know, the stylist can come in or the hair and makeup and they could, you know, add that element to your work as well. Um, so I just think, you know, it's important to go on that journey with yourself and not kind of worry about what everyone else is doing and stay true to who you are and just experiment and kind of document and try something new out of the box and, you know, express yourself and gradually as you go from there, you'll, you'll gain that confidence and you'll gain kind of more, you know, there'll be a kind of a signature and theme within your work because you'll go back to doing something you've tried because you like it and you like kind of, you know, documenting those things or shooting in a certain way. So I would just say, you know, just just carry on and don't don't be too bogged down with the idea of I need to have a signature style to be to be recognised and I need to have it now because it's important to let it grow and develop organically um, because you know that's what kind of creates the best work. If you're thinking too much about you know um, I need to shoot in this certain way or I I need to be in this way, then you're not going to be creating work that's genuine and true to yourself. So I hope that answered from me. Question. Okay. Emily, how are we on time? Sorry. Okay. No. Sorry, go on. Um, I mean, it, it, it is something that takes a really long time. Yeah. Like, okay. And you kind of get a good idea when you've hit the point when you've kind of like found a spot that you can keep on revisiting and like growing from. Um, for me, like, I was able, I think, to get to that point too because I was just shooting every single day. Um, and coming from fashion, wanting to be a fashion photographer, but then like going out, doing something personal, and then coming back in too, like having that time away, focus on what you're feeling, what are you interested in, who are you hanging out with? And then for me too, like I only shoot digital. And digital for me allowed me to just kind of shoot endlessly and not have to worry about the cost of getting more film or it allowed me to learn, I think, maybe a little bit faster. Or just like, because there was this kind of endless, and it, like both are, I think both are great and like it depends what you're kind of drawn to. But digital did, I think, help me kind of find that maybe a little bit sooner than if I was doing film, just because of saving money, I guess. And, but yeah, no, it's, it's all about just really like swooping out like really getting to know yourself, like spend time with people around you and yeah, just you'll, you'll know when you hit it. You just have to keep on going and there's no rush. Yeah. I think we need to end it there, but uh, copies of the magazine are available up front. So thank you to all of our panelists.